Symbiosis, Chapter 2, The St. Agrippina Hospital When Timothy got outside, he found that his car had been brought to Anselm's house as ordered. He got in, and with one last look at the house, he left. He had a bit of a drive ahead of him since the hospital was located on the edge of the city, but he didn't care. On the way, he stopped at an all-night restaurant he frequented to eat, since he hadn't eaten all day, and as a forced celebration of his victory. As much as it was indeed a victory, he wasn't in a celebratory mindset. The capture of Anselm was only a single, albeit difficult, step on solving what, what machinations had been set in motion. Timothy knew this, and had for years. From his booth by the window, Timothy could see the hospital way off in the distance glowing against the night sky. One of the metacopters was racing in to land from the north. He knew that he shouldn't take so long, but it was the first break he'd taken in a long time. Still, though, he took some much-needed and well-deserved time to breathe. He didn't decide to leave until the sky started showing a faint hint of the next day's approach. He ordered a coffee to go after paying for his meal and left a generous tip for the exhausted-looking server, a young woman who'd been working there for years. Curiously, leaving the tip had made him feel better than finally catching Anselm. He'd never learned her name and had neglected ever looking at her name tag. Undoubtedly, she must have known who he was since he'd been on the news several times, but had never called attention to his identity. She smiled as she gave him his coffee and said goodbye to him as he left, to which he gave a simple nod and a return smile, and he rarely smiled. On the way to his car, he allowed himself for one brief moment to pretend that nothing bad was going on. Thinking about the young woman gave him a sense of peace inside, a warmth that was just as seldom an experience as smiling. Once at St. Agrippina, Timothy went inside through a back entrance usually reserved for patient transfers and medical deliveries. He navigated the halls with the same ease and familiarity that any of the veteran hospital staff possessed. After approaching a set of locked double doors and swiping a card he had pulled from his inside pocket, he passed through and turned around and waited for the doors to close. He swiped his card again on the scanner next to the doors and a loud double beep echoed down the empty hallways followed by the sound of the secondary locks engaging. His footsteps reverberated loudly against the barren and silent corridor ahead of him as he made his way down. He came to an intersection and turned left, walking under a sign hanging from the ceiling reading Section A. As he pressed further down this long hallway, he passed several doors and then a long window. He turned his head as he walked, never stopping, and looked with sadness and worry at all of Anselm's victims all the women who had not survived the psychopath's experiments. This giant room, although having having had a different title in the past, was now the DO, or Dead Observation Room. Just past where the window ended was a blank, white, windowless door with heavy locks. This was the only entrance to the DO room. Just past this door was another one made of plain, yellowish wood and a basic lock. Timothy opened it and entered. Inside was a man sitting at a receptionist's desk wearing all white. He looked up at Timothy and pointed with a nod at the door to his right. Timothy, remaining silent, nodded in reply and entered through the door the man had pointed at, shutting it behind him. Congratulations, Timotheus. Excellent work said a gruff-looking man standing at a window facing the D.O. room. The tone of his voice and worried expression lacked completely the sentiment he'd expressed in his words. He didn't look away from the window as Timothy approached. Thank you, sir, Timothy replied just as unenthusiastically to the chief of police. Is there any news on the deceased? Yes, actually. How long has it been since you've checked in? The chief asked. 
I'm not really sure, sir. Perhaps as long as a few weeks. Why? Timothy said. Well, they've continued their analysis on all of them and finally got some answers. We're dealing with something new here, the chief said. We believe that Anselm's rare blood type is what allowed his body to inherit the Loenin from Elica, despite his father not being genetically compatible. None of us are AB negative, nor have any of us ever done it with anyone of that blood type and then survived, let alone produce any children. With Elica being the one exception, of course, and she's aging faster than she should have. Have you seen her? She's near my age, but doesn't look it, poor woman, the chief said. In fact, to look at him, the chief would appear almost half her age. Yes, we know, sir. We saw her earlier. We are, as you should know, aware of the difficulties with blood types, Timothy replied, unintentionally sounding a little impatient. Well, so is Anselm. The chief paused for a moment and wiped the sweat off of his face and then finally looked at Timothy with a grave concern. He did something to them, Timotheus. There are no signs of decay, even though there's no signs of life, no breathing, no response to stimuli, not even any brain activity. All except for his first four victims, which are decaying, but extremely slowly. Everyone else seems to be in some sort of stasis. Do you remember that we found that each one of them we had examined had dormant loenin within? The chief asked. Of course, it was assumed that all of them did. It was also discovered that each Lowenin was from Anselm and that they were all juveniles. Why do you ask? Timothy said. The chief had the annoying tendency to reiterate facts, no matter what the subject. Well, almost all of them do have Lowenin. The rest have dormant eggs. And some have both. Eggs, sir? Timothy asked, taken aback. Yes, eggs. And yes, they're also Anselm's, the chief said. How can that be? Timothy asked, perplexed. That? Hmm. We don't know. None of his victims show any signs of sexual assault. Somehow Anselm could produce eggs and he has no female Lewinen. We can only assume that he surgically implanted them inside of most of his victims, the chief said. The chief turned and grabbed a manila folder off of his desk and pulled out an x-ray. Holding it up to the light, he pointed to a mass located just under the solar plexus. It was clear to see the outline of a small worm coiled around a collection of small round objects. The mass was as big as the Lewin in itself, and each egg was the size of a pea. The chief looked disgusted and greatly angered by this insult to the values of their kind and the invasion that had been uncovered as was Timothy. It hadn't been long, it hadn't been that long that they had decided to observe the victims, and even then it was only after a failure in the paperwork had occurred, allowing for one of the bodies to remain in the morgue for long enough for it to raise suspicion about its lack of decay. After this fact, they had to exhume the bodies of all the others, only to find that they, too, had not decayed at all, or even lost body heat, even after a year or two had passed some even longer. The chief's voice grew deep as he continued and spoke with an ominous, angry voice. Almost two-thirds of them are nests. The other third, we, we just don't know what to expect. Anselm broke all of our laws, never mind human laws. I don't know how he learned of the cult and their practices. Only his mother knew of them, and she wouldn't. She... He paused and took a deep breath. His voice returned to normal as he spoke. I'm worried, Timothys. I'm worried that he was trying to make it so that the Loenin, or at least his Loenin, could inhabit any human. None of them are actually dead. Their hearts don't beat, blood doesn't flow, and they don't breathe. But if you cut them, they heal. They heal almost instantly as if they were natural living loy like us. It is why we believe he surgically implanted them. 
It's also why it has taken us this long to learn this much. The chief threw the folder and the x-ray onto the desk and took a long, deep breath as tentacles under his skin moved and shifted. Timothy could feel his own Lewinan moving and shifting within himself, equally infuriated by Anselm's abominable actions, their voices screaming in his mind with outrage in unison with his own. He looked through the window and examined every bed inside. He was about to speak when something caught his attention. The SWAT team member who'd been attacked wasn't in the room. Sir, where is the man Anselm attacked? The SWAT team member? Timothy inquired. The chief sighed before turning and his expression changed to that of utter confused fear, which only worsened Timothy's own fears since the chief never looked afraid. He's in the tank, the chief said gravely. I'll show him to you. He gestured to follow, then turned and exited the office with Timothy following close behind. They exited out into the hallway and went back towards the intersection in the main corridor. They took the hallway leading off to the right, labeled Section C, where they met at the end with a large blast door. The chief pulled out a card and swiped it next to, the, next to a screen and placed his hand on the screen. The screen flashed twice and the door swung open mechanically, a yellow hazard light spinning slowly on the wall above the door. Next to the light was a sign reading in all capitals, Quarantine Vault. They entered, and the door swung shut with locking bolts sliding into place with a muffled thump. The hallway they now stood in was mostly dark, with individual light bulbs shining down from the ceiling every ten feet. On each side of the hallway, by each light, were windows which showed nothing but stark darkness inside. They walked for some distance before the chief stopped beside a window on the left. Next to the window sat a series of, series of switches. This is him, as he, he said as he reached out his hand and pulled down a small lever. Holding the spring-loaded switch in place, the lights flickered on within the room on the other side of the window. The room was completely empty, with the exception of an examination table in the middle of the room. <clears throat> Jim, Timothy gasped in shock at seeing the man. The man he'd seen back at the house was thin, but the man he saw before him was now clearly undergoing some sort of physical transformation. He lay there, covered only with a sheet from the waist down. His arms were still thin, but the man's torso and neck were severely swollen, red from the swelling, and pulsating unevenly. What's happening to him? He's dead. His body has shut down. You can clearly see the early signs of decay. But Anselm's Lowenin is eating the corpse and it's growing, the chief said. All that swelling, that is the Lowenin that attacked him. We don't know anything about it and I'm not letting anyone in there. So far, we can only assume that it's because Anselm's unique physiology Whatever it is he inherited that allowed him to develop past the first trimester. The chief trailed off after a moment. Timothy looked in horror at the corpse on the table. How could one Loenan get so big and still be growing? The man's face was devoid of any expression. His arms and legs weren't moving, but his head gently swayed from side to side. Suddenly, the man's head straightened out so that it was facing up at the ceiling. His neck swelled and then his mouth opened. A mixture of blood, organ fluids, and yellowish mucus oozed out of the mouth just before a thick red tentacle slid out. It twisted and writhed around for a bit before it slid down and wrapped around, his, around the neck of the corpse. The tentacle stopped moving at this point, leaving only the original movements of the quickly growing worm inside. <clears throat> Where is Anne's home? Timothy asked grimly, still staring through the window and barely able to speak. The chief let go of the switch. It flipped up and clicked into place, plunging the room back in darkness. 
He stepped over to the next window down the hallway, Timothy following close behind, and then pulled the switch for that room. Illuminated within sat a shivering Anselm, still in handcuffs. He'd been bit pretty beaten. Be- he'd been beaten pretty badly. His clothes were ripped and had blood on them. It was one hell of a fight getting him in here. We actually just got him in here just a little before you arrived. Only then it was after we knocked him unconscious, the chief said. Timothy noticed that Anselm was also wearing special devices on his feet that he hadn't seen in decades. They were called crawlers, a pair of sandal-like metal shoes with barbed metal spikes that pointed at the bottom of the wearer's feet. If a person wearing crawlers tried to stand up, the spikes went through their feet. The spikes were spring-loaded so that they'd pull back out when not when the person wearing them was not standing. Timothy could only assume that Anselm had not only put up a great fight, but all had tried to escape repeatedly, leaving his captivity to be secured by these primitive and outdated torture devices. Anselm lifted his head, and his throat swelled. Not even a full second later, he launched a Loenin at the window. The worm hit with a dull thud, its tentacles struggling feebly as it slid down the glass, out of view, and onto the floor. There were two other Loenins slithering around the concrete floor next to it. The chief let go of the switch, returning Anselm and his worms to darkness. He's been doing this the whole time. He... The chief paused. He is producing more and more all the time. We think this is why he escalated his kidnappings. Did he spread to anyone else on the way here? Timothy asked. No, thankfully, but we did have to kill several of his own Loen and getting him in here. The chief replied, The chief stirred uncomfortably in place before trying to speak. However, nothing came out. He simply turned and began walking away. Timothy followed him as they walked back the way they came. He felt he knew what the chief was going to ask and stopped him from opening the blast door. Sir, Timothy said simply. The chief sighed before finally turning to look at him. Timotheus, you have been our greatest asset in protecting the established balance. Your services with the cult can never be denied or... He paused momentarily and stared at Timothy, studying him. Adril, my loyalties are to the Loy and our peace with the humans. I have abandoned the cult and its practices forever. Surely, you can't have any doubt of this, Timothy said. We know you're loyal. We know you're all loyal. But we know that one of Anselm's Loinen are in your midst, Adriel said. We are committed and faithful, Timothy said, his voice returning to the deep, multi-toned voice that comes when any Loy speaks with the collective presence of both the human and the Loinen symbiotic entities. Anselm's Loenin cannot change us, nor sway us. Adriel spoke this time in his own multi-voice. It was a little deeper than Timothy's, and sounded as if it were, as if there were more of him. Has it tried anything yet? he asked. No, sir. We are trying to bond it, but it is resisting. We can tell there's knowledge there to be gained. We will wear it down, Timothy said. Be careful, Timotheus. This is new territory for us, and we don't want to lose you, Adriel said. Thank you, Adriel. Timothy bowed his head to the chief in acknowledgement, and they left the quarantine vault. They both walked in silence as they returned to the intersection and turned down the hallway labeled Section B. The glass doors at the end slid open on their own accord as they approached. 
To anyone else, this area looked like a typical hospital setting with equipment and staff everywhere. Each room was small, with one bed inside and one wall. It was all glass with a glass sliding door and curtains that could be drawn shut for privacy when needed. These rooms held the survivors. They continued down past the rooms, following the open pathway until it turned around the corner where the rooms for admitted patients were sent. There were several doors with a single window in the wall next to them. These were the chambers.